Coming up this week on Hands on Tech, moving from a consumer Wi-Fi system to a prosumer Wi-Fi system. Next. This is Twit. Hello, everybody. Leo Laporte here. Uh, so we've talked a lot on all of our shows about Wi-Fi. It's the number one question I get on the tech guy. How come my Wi-Fi is so bad? It really has gone downhill. For a long time, my recommendation was to move to a mesh system. That's been a big improvement. And for most people, it's probably all you need to do. Uh, we have a sponsor, Eero. I was using Eero at home. I've used Ubiquity's uh, uh, stuff. I've used uh, Netgear's stuff, a variety of things. But at some point... Well, to be honest, my dear wife said, what's going on with the Wi-Fi? <laughs> Especially now that we're all working from home. Her stepson is doing his uh, high school, he's a senior, school work at home. That involves a lot of Zoom, a lot of internet. Uh, she's working from home, doing her home office. Uh, I'm sitting at home uh, playing around. So between the three of us, we're using a lot of bandwidth. So the first step in this decision process was, let's go from Wi-Fi to wired wherever we could. Now, that was a big deal. That involved getting somebody to come out, go through the attic and the crawl space, drop wires in the walls. But we were able to get hardwired Ethernet into the most important places, my wife's workstation, my son's workstation, my workstation, and yes, uh, a couple of home theater areas because we also want high quality streaming uh, video as we watch uh, TV. So that made us, you know, that got us at least half the way. At that point, we had to make a decision. What are we going to use? What gear are we going to use to control this stuff? And even with hardwired Ethernet, there was still the issue of laptops, phones, and IoT devices, most of which are on Wi-Fi. I looked at a lot of different solutions. In fact, the company that installed the Ethernet proposed a solution, uh, something that a lot of home theater installers used. I let them put them in. I wasn't really happy with it, mostly because I didn't have control. The whole thing was set up uh, for people with no technical expertise. The home theater control uh, installer was the guy who controlled it. If I had a problem, we'd call him. He'd fix it. You know me. I didn't like that solution. So I talked to Russell, our IT guru, and a few other people, including John Slanina, our studio manager. And they all said, there's a couple of ways you can go. Here at the studio, we use an enterprise system called Ruckus. Uh, the problem with Ruckus, there's a yearly maintenance fee. It's fairly tricky to set up and install. Uh, Russell and John both said, Try Ubiquity. Now, this is a name I know a lot of you have heard. Ubiquity makes, I would say, prosumer-grade equipment. There have been numerous issues. If, if you follow the Ubiquity subreddit uh, on reddit.com, you'll see people complaining all the time about beta software crashes and problems. But Russell assured me, if you, if you don't use the beta versions, if you stick with the stable versions, uh, you should be pretty happy with Ubiquity. One real advantage the Ubiquity system has is you can hardwire the access points. We decided to put in five access points. Our home's fairly large. It's a single story spread out over 4,000 square feet. So that meant that a single base station at one end is not going to serve the other end. So we decided to put Ethernet in the attic, drop it down five different locales in the house. Uh, and I uh, installed there Ubiquiti's uh, HD wireless access points. Uh, these are the AC Pros. Uh, they're kind of cool looking. They look like a flying saucer with a blue ring light. You can disable the light if it's in your bedroom. We put one in the garage because we have cameras around the house. We have garage sensors. I wanted one that would help us with the outdoors area. We also put uh, one each in each wing of the house. The house kind of spread out, so there's a, a north wing and a south wing. We put one in our bedroom because, uh, well, frankly, we spent a lot of time in there, and we put one kind of in a central position, and that's mostly for the IoT devices. So with five access points, we have really great coverage throughout the house. Uh, once I set that up, I needed a router. For that, we chose the Ubiquity Dream Machine Pro or UDM Pro. There's several levels of UDM. John uses uh, kind of the base UDM, which looks more like a Wi-Fi access point you'd be used to. This one is rack mounted. We put a rack in a, a, a spare closet to hold it. We also, because we had so many Ethernet ports, we had to put in a, uh, a switch 
that would go from the UDM router into the switch, and those would then have Ethernet jacks spread out. Uh, Ubiquiti makes a variety of different size switches, 4, 8, uh, I th there might be a 16. I think there is. Uh, we ended up, I don't know, overkill. I was looking at the 24-port solution. We ended up getting the 48-port solution. Lots of room to grow here. There's another thing I really like about these. These are managed switches. So everything I put in was from Ubiquity was managed so I can, at a central console, see what's going on. And furthermore, these are PoE, Power Over Ethernet. I needed that because the access points don't have power plugs. They get their power over the Ethernet jack. So by using power over Ethernet, I can power these uh, work, you know, these these access points everywhere. It's a much simpler process than having to give them uh, electricity as well. It's also great if I decide to expand. Ubiquity offers cameras, doorbells, other IoT style s solutions, including telephones, and all of them can be powered over Ethernet. Again, really simplifying the process. I don't have to have a plug socket outside. All I need to do is get them an Ethernet drop. So PoE was a big deal. 48 ports, maybe maybe overkill. We're driving it. We have a Comcast consumer grade uh, internet connection in my neighborhood Comcast does offer gigabit connections so we have a thousand megabits down 40 megabits up that's proven to be more than enough we do have a lot of devices here I'm going to go to the UDM interface this is the software interface I love this because not only can I do this inside the network I can do it from outside the network logging in through the ubiquity unify portal so I can see from anywhere exactly what's going on so this is the more modern uh, up updated version of the interface. You see, I can go back to the classic dashboard if I want to. I don't. I really like this. They now have real-time performance monitoring, which is really fantastic. I can see here, for instance, at peak with everybody using the internet, I never got over 332 megabits per second. That means I have a lot of headroom because I have a thousand megabit per second uh, connection. This will really help you, I think, decide how much bandwidth you need. You can see my access points. I can go look at individual access points. I can look at the 2.4 gigahertz band. I can look at the 5 gigahertz band. This is real-time updating. They give you a score uh, for the Wi-Fi experience. I don't even really know what it means. Uh, I guess higher is better. Uh, it has something to do with how many devices are, are dropped or kicked uh, during their Wi-Fi access, things like that. Um, they, you, they break it down. You see I have 75 clients total. They break it down by operating system. Uh, that's kind of cool. You can see, in fact, if any particular operating system has more trouble than others. Mac OS X is a 99%, well, iOS is a 97%, uh, but you see you have a lot more iOS devices, 17 iOS devices. You can break that down into wired. Those are the workstations that are set up via the uh, 48 port switch. You can set up a guest network. I haven't uh, because we don't have any guests. But once people start coming over, I guess I'll set up a guest network. There's some kind of, I don't know, is this a cool feature? This is the map, which shows you all the devices and what's connected to what. I think Ubiquity, because of their heritage, it was founded by an Apple engineer, perhaps is a little bit focused on on a pretty uh, look. I don't find this useful. I never go into the map mode. Much more useful to look at my switches and uh, routers. Uh, these are the access points, front hallway, garage, gym hallway, master bedroom, Michael's bedroom. Yes, the kid gets his own access point. Uh, doesn't use it much. He only has a few devices. Here's the routers. This is the 48-port PoE switch. You can see on the right lots of information about it. It's local IP address. It's public IP address. It's load average. Uh, you get really granular in here. I can look at the radios, and I can see what's going on with those. I can see which a wide area network I'm using, in this case a single one, although it does have the ability to uh, have uh, multiple networks. I don't know if it does bonding. I think they're more intended for failover than they are for uh, bonding. Uh, here's the switches. Um, big switch, little switch, 48 port switch. Here's the access points. Uh, we can see how they're utilized. There is so much information in here. Here are all the clients. I can see what network they're on, the secure LAN, 
uh, or the uh, insecure LAN, the IoT LAN, which access point they're using. I've gone through, it does a pretty good job of figuring out what's what, but I've gone through uh, and painstakingly labeled everything so I know exactly, you know, what's my Mac Pro doing. It's wired. I can see how much data it's used. Um, you even can rank them if you want on upload and download. Let's take a look at my most active devices. The Apple TV in the living room, 119 gigabytes in the last, I think it's week. Um, so that's fascinating. You get statistics as well. A lot of this is eye candy. But, I, you know, I think there's, there's insights in here that you can gain. They even have an insights tab, which I find no more insightful than any other tab. Honestly, Ubiquity offers a huge number of settings, and most of them are probably over my head. A lot of them are in beta. Russell's counsel was, thing, was yeah, avoid stuff like the, the, the beta bandwidth shaping stuff. Um, I, I, I made it pretty simple. It's worked really reliably, so I didn't turn on a lot of features. There is an excellent, I think, threat management console, which allows me to filter out different kinds of traffic. You can see here I have a map of the world. I'm blocking traffic from not to but from Russia and China. That means no one can come into my network from Russia and China. If I were worried, it's easy enough to say, oh, I don't want any traffic from the Ukraine either. Um, honestly, a lot of the threats I get come from the United Kingdom, Canada. <laughs> you can see them here. And I think that's not because they're actually UK hackers getting involved, but everybody's using Tor and VPNs to route themselves into other countries. You can see the total threats, threats by severity. I can actually look at a traffic log. Here's the scans of endpoints. This is good news because uh, nobody's actually scanning endpoints. You can even set up, and I haven't done this, a honeypot if you want, uh, to try to uh, trap hackers in your network. You can take a look at the event log. There are a variety of different kinds of events. You can look at admin, LAN, and uh, wide area network. You can look at errors. You can look at warnings and just general warnings. Most of these are uh, not important, although occasionally you'll see a device that is disconnecting on a regular basis, might have trouble with the Wi-Fi. Um, that's, that's useful for diagnosing problems. I haven't spent a lot of time uh, with this interface. But if there is an issue, it's nice to be able to go in here and uh, take a look at it. Another great feature of the UDM Pro is I can create VLANs or virtual local area networks. And I'm using that feature to segregate my IoT devices. Here are my two LANs, Godzilla, and these are the Wi-Fi uh, SSIDs. Godzilla is on the LAN. Mothra is on the secure LAN. Those are names I gave to those different VLANs. Uh, once you've set up VLANs like that, it's very easy to configure them to do a variety of things. You see that the subnets are different. Uh, the IoT LAN, the regular LAN, is a 192.168.1.0. Secure LAN is 2.0. By separating like that, I can control a lot uh, of, of things that are going on. I can set firewall rules. You see there is content filtering uh, that you can use if you want to use their built-in content filtering. You can see uh, oh, a whole lot of stuff. Very cons conservative about the, the settings I use because goodness knows they're it's completely possible to screw yourself up <laughs> heavily. Uh, here's the internet threat management. Um, again, this is not turned on by default. I decided to turn it on. They note that because you're doing stateful packet inspection, it might slow throughput down. I find the throughput adequate, but that's something you might want to pay attention to. You can customize this heavily to block bots and malware and trojans and worms. You can turn off Tor, as I have, but leave peer-to-peer -peer, uh, on, which I have, you can see all of the different settings. This is fantastic. I, I honestly think this kind of control is amazing in, in a uh, router and very, very handy. I, of course, of course, as Steve Gibson recommends, turn off universal plug and play. But you see, if you turn it on, you do have a lot of control over what's going on. I can, for instance, I could say that only the secure LAN has universal plug and play. Um, so if you needed UPnP, I don't. Um, but if you needed it, you could turn it on and even do it a little bit more securely. 
I do have firewall rules. These firewall rules are designed to control uh, the lands. So I have a firewall rule that allows um, Mothra, the secure land, to control the IoT land. So it accepts all incoming traffic from the secure land, but it blocks all out all traffic from the insecure land into the secure land. So if one of my IoT devices is hacked, it can't become a gateway into the devices I want to keep secure, my computers, my smartphones, things like that. System settings go on and on and on. You can, <laughs> you can do a lot with the Unify system settings. I did turn on automatic firmware upgrades. Uh, there are some people who say, oh, don't do that. Uh, but so far, so good. They don't push beta upgrades. They only push uh, uh, stable upgrades. So, so far, it's been... Uh, it's been okay. Occasionally, though, after a firmware upgrade, I've found uh, some things unresponsive. A reboot uh, uh, so far has, has been able to fix that. There's a lot of security in this. For instance, uh, at one point, I, uh, I m updated my uh, switches and my router, and my access points became unresponsive. They're set up, and I think this is actually a great feature, they're set up to know who's controlling them. If that control gets changed, they won't respond to anything else. So it requires a reset of the access points if you make any major changes to the UDM. I've been careful not to do that since. There's a really another really nice feature for the geeks. You can SSH into your UDM, your router, and control it uh, on the command line. That SSH feature is really nice in case you lose the Unify interface, the graphical interface, or you want to make some major changes in there. Uh, again, this is a you know kind of a black diamond tip for people who really know a little bit more about what they're doing than I do. I'm, I'm staying out of the SSH. I'm not turning on a lot of the beta features. I'm sticking with much more stable but older firmware. That's given me a very robust system. And here's the best news. I don't hear any more complaints from anybody in the house. They're fast. They're wired. Now, a couple of additional features you can look at. It's up to you you uh, you could if you wish uh, do things like filtering uh, you know a pie hole there's lots of uh, things you can do uh, again more advanced I'm reluctant to mess around too much but this UDM is actually a, a full-blown computer with a, a hard drive uh, an interface through SSH and if you wish you could install some additional software on there like pie hole software what I do instead is I route everything through next DNS I've talked about this before next DNS.io uh, they're in effect a pie hole in the sky it's inexpensive just a few bucks a year and I as a result can have advertisement blocking malware blocking a lot more control uh, of what's going on on my network. The combination of NextDNS, the Ubiquiti hardware, the Ubiquiti software has given us a very stable, very speedy connection. It is expensive. You'll spend a lot of money. It costs even more to have people crawling around in the attic and drop Ethernet wires. But I, I, at this point, with all of us working from home, I felt like this is an investment I'm willing to make so that we have just rock-solid Internet. And it has been really really great uh, i highly recommend uh, the ubiquity gear they advance it all the time uh, i bought it through russell he's a reseller and as a result i was able to get a little bit of a discount i think about a 10 percent discount you can buy direct from ubiquity they're even on amazon when i buy additional switches those little four port switches they're inexpensive about 50 60 bucks i buy those on amazon i don't need to buy them uh, through russell but if you could find a reseller an expert who can help you with this that's all to the better I felt like I was able to do it myself and 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 do it pretty easily. Uh, and I'm awfully happy with the result. I have full control over what goes on in our network. I feel like it's more secure separating out the IoT device, the threat protection that's offered by Ubiquity. All of that means I've got a really good system. So do I recommend it? Absolutely. If you've got the money and you've got the need or desire for a very nice prosumer system, Ubiquity is great. And a small business... I absolutely think it's a great idea. Uh, and, and in most cases, if you're kind of geeky, you can probably do it yourself. I'm Leo Laporte. That's it for Hands on Tech, a look at the Ubiquity prosumer system, at least the one I installed at home. Thanks for joining me. We'll see you next time.
Hey folks, thanks for tuning in to another show here on the Twit Network. If you are a fan of home automation, internet of things, and all things smart technology, you should check out my podcast, Smart Tech Today. I do it with Matthew Casanelli, and we have so much fun talking about all the latest news for all things smart tech. Keep up with all the hottest tech news and gadgets. Visit twit.tv. There you'll be able to find and subscribe to all our tech shows. Thanks for watching Hands on Tech.